I took it as my title, Avoiding Collapse, the Ecological Basis of Today's Utopias. Uh, I think I was invited as a, a, a Neko villager in, in, the, in South Jordan, Neko village, uh, to reflect upon the ways in which we're trying to respond to the issue of um, that, that, that our president, for example, has posed to us. It, it, it struck me in rereading his words, uh, the words of his two talks that have already been quoted from at the LSE just exactly a year ago and slightly previous to that when he was receiving the honorary doctorate from the NUI, the sense of urgency that he emphasises that motivated the great social thinkers of the 19th century as they were offering new perspectives that laid the foundations for the sorts of societies that we've all benefited from in the 20th century. And his emphasis on the fact that we today face probably greater challenges than they face. And I, I absolutely agree with him on that. Our scientists are telling us that we face a planetary emergency. Those are my words, those are the words of some of the most eminent scientists in dealing with the galloping changes that climate change is imposing upon us. Just last November, the World Bank, normally producing very sedate reports, produced a report that warned as I say there, of devastating scenarios which, if we continue our present trajectory, are going to be faced within the lifetime of our present students. So we are facing a crisis not just of, an, of our environment, but of our social system. And climate change and peak oil, twin but separate challenges that we face, pose fundamental questions about the basis of our modern industrial civilization as the United Nations Development Programme's Human Development Report noted in its 2010 report, our model of development is now knocking up against objective limits. And those objective limits pose questions over an economy based upon growth. They pose questions over the principal mechanisms of that economy, which is a consumer society, with its planned obsolescence, with its mechanisms of living off credit that we all carry around in our wallets, numerous ones, and with its obs obscene and, and, and highly monetized forms of publicity that create wants rather than needs that drive our consumption patterns. And it poses questions over the kind of polity global polities, national polities, polities at local level that can allow us to move beyond these breaks on being able to respond to the challenges that we're facing. In, this is the context in which President Higgins mentions the importance of utopian thinking, of thinking outside the box, of recognising the need to imagine a different future. And in this it's interesting that he's responding to recognitions internationally that utopian thinking has now become a very important dimension of the response to our present multiple and highly severe challenges. I noted, for example, that in the autumn, Le Monde, when they were planning a new atlas to add to their highly acclaimed series, where they have atlases of civilization, of globalization, of migrations, of religions, chose what? La place de utopie. This, is, this contains 200 maps spread, uh, spanning 25 centuries of utopian thinking. Now, what is the challenge of this to education? Our universities, says President Higgins in one of these addresses, are challenged to become a space from which new futures have always emerged and must do so again. I take this to mean that he believes they're not doing so now, and if he does, then I share that belief with him. Because, unfortunately, at the very time when universities are being called upon to play this absolutely vital role, we find them being bludgeoned ever more to serving the dominant systems and to closing down spaces for really radical and imaginative social thinking. 
And in this context, we so urgently need to discover what President Higgins talks about as the unities of scholarship. And yet, in this context, we're being driven ever more into narrow disciplinary silos. All our incentive systems are driving us back into our closed disciplines. President Higgins mentions the need, the urgent need, to link up philosophy and theology as the great speculative endeavours of our civilization, so undervalued today, with the disciplines of technology, of science, of the humanities, of administration, of the social sciences, as he spoke about so eloquently in, in what we heard. But all of them recognizing the objective environmental limits that we must begin again to live within if we're going to have a future on this planet. So in that situation, we need to rediscover the tensions that have always been at the heart of true education. It's driven in two different directions. One is the direction of socializing us into becoming good citizens of an actual society. We tend to do that very well, probably too well. Because the other dimension of all authentic education is to become critics of the orthodoxies that drive those dominant systems. It's that dimension of education that I fear has been greatly weakened in today's university systems. Have they lost this essential tension? And it's, it's often we find in alternative educational spaces that we find the essential core questions that President Higgins himself identified from the work of Immanuel Kant should inform all education, that these core questions are being asked elsewhere. These are the essential questions of what might we know, of what should we do, and the most important question of all, of what may we hope. These are the sorts of questions, for example, that inform our attempts in the Echo Village in Clough Jordan to provide alternative spaces for education, which draw people together hungry for knowledge, hungry for that hope to change our society in radical ways. And I give you there the web link to our program of education, well, to our website, which gives you our program of education for this coming year. So what in this context does education need to do? It needs, again, it seems to me, to urgently become the space from which new futures are incubated. And in doing that, it needs to return to that rich concept that the man who I think is our leading philosopher of education, Joe Dunn, uh, in his two-volume work, philosophizing about the nature, the essential nature of education, called the rough ground. I think we need to face the huge civilizational questions rather than to be caught by the narrow technical questions which dominate our education today. I think we need to awaken the emancipatory imaginations, and this is equivalent to the utopian aspirations, I think, of our students who face the dark burdens of our future. We need to place the transition to a post-carbon society at the heart of all our endeavours, particularly the endeavours of the social sciences, of economics, of politics, of sociology, where it seems to me they are largely missing. And until that begins to happen, I don't think we can blame our politicians, our political systems, ourselves as consumers and citizens for failing to face these enormous challenges of climate change and peak oil. And finally, we need to sow seeds of collaborative hope, not of competition, which drives the value systems of our universities and our wider society, but of hopeful collaboration in order to strengthen a resilience for the tough times ahead. In this situation, we face a grim option. This is the central option which um, which of you quoted Michael Dee's wonderful words where he, where he did talk about this option for the future? Collapse beckons our industrial civilization as it has happened in all previous civilizations. The deep divisions of our societies nationally and globally being more, made more profound amid this crisis we are now in the heart of. Added to that a generational crisis between the people of our generation who are the beneficiaries 
of our present socio-economic system and the younger generation who are bearing the burdens of austerity. The lack of horizons of hope which are so palpably present in our Western societies with their high levels of drug taking and escapism and the lack of any horizon of hope which is so troubling. And the financial capitalism, this final incarnation of capitalism, which now is destroying around us day by day livelihoods and destroying our planet. We need urgently to move beyond that. When is collapse going to happen? Some of our social scientists are putting dates on it. Serge Latouche, in a book I read when I was in, in Spain last autumn, mentions three possible dates, one as close as 2030, perhaps as far back as 2070 if we manage to get our act together. But collapse is beckoning. And the option for us is, are we going to plan together a way of moving to this totally new society, this radically new socio-economic system, which we have to move to if we're going to survive on this planet? Or are we going to allow it be imposed upon us, as we've already surpassed by one and a half times the ecological biocapacity of the planet? And in Ireland, for example, we've surpassed it almost six times with our uh, ecological put footprint of 6.22 um, global hectares per person, when the limit of the planet is 1.78. We are one of the societies on Earth which has the widest global footprint. Those are the options that face us. It's going to be imposed violently or we're going to plan it. And the only mechanism, the only tool we have that allows us to make this option is education. Thank you.